So we should all be able to see the presentation. If you can't, put some kind of a indicator up there so Sean can holler at me and let me know that you're not not seeing the the screen. Um, if it's just one or two of you, it might be a one of those gremlins. If it's all of you, then it's a gremlin on my end. So, um, so I'd like to welcome you all here on this snowy November morning. At least for those of you here in Colorado in the snow. If you're in Florida, I don't want to hear it. <laughs> the drive-in was not per pretty. You know how it is. That first real snow that gets the roads all all bad and everything. Everybody forgets how much you know effort it takes to to drive on snow. And I also heard this morning that. Uh, a large part of our migrants in the past year have come from California and they might not know how to drive in snow, so that could explain a lot. So everything, everybody should be situated now as Sean gave you all your tutorial on how this is going to work. Uh, I'm going to try to keep myself on time and on task. Um, Sean might have to holler at me. I sometimes get squirreled, as we say around my house, a little off task. But what we're going to do today is um, kind of look at some of the things that are going on in the world of neuroscience and look at some of the things that are going on in the world of academia, specifically looking at the educational psychology aspects and trying to bridge those two um, entities because for many, many years the two had not talked to each other. They didn't communicate. They pretended the other didn't exist and there was a lot of skeptics out there that that insisted that neuroscience and and the educational psychology world did not come together. And in the past couple of decades, we've started to realize that, yes, they do need to come together. Yes, they do have relevance to one another. And we are now starting to play in the same sandbox and attempting to get along. So that's, that's my attempt here is to show you where that bridge is and to focus more. Um, I mean, the whole thing could be several series of, of webinars. But the focus is to, to show you that bridge between education and neuroscience, specifically in engaging your students and motivating them and keeping them motivated. Because I know in an online situation, sometimes that becomes a challenge. And a lot of the stuff that I'll tell you today is relevant to face-to-face -to -face as well as online. But I do have a, a special segment at the end of the presentation in terms of focusing on a, an online platform and how we can engage and motivate our students knowing what's going on in their brains. So during this presentation, you will be introduced to that synergy of, of neuroscience and education along with their direct application to teaching with an emphasis on the engagement and the motivation. And kind of like this cartoon, as I mentioned before, the two worlds never really spoke. We thought, well, yeah, there's this education thing and then there's this brain thing and something in the middle might be happening. There might be a miracle occurring, but we're not sure. We're not going to talk about it, and that's that's kind of where we're going to take it today. So while brain research does not provide all of the um, answers to our educational problems, when the research is well grounded and and correlated with strategies and actions that are consistent with knowledgeable interpretations of the research, we can successfully apply that knowledge to learning processes and we can make use of the brain's natural learning tendencies. As a, you know, if, if there's a basic understanding of the educational neuroscience, it can uh, guide the person in the classroom, or in this case, in the online platform, it can guide you to improving your student motivation and, and your student's engagement. So let's kind of look um, at the brain itself. We're going to take a short, uh, central nervous system anatomy class real quick just to get ourselves a, a road map of what we're talking about. So when we're looking at our brain, the adult brain has uh, a few different regions to it that are going to be of importance to us. We have two cerebral hemispheres. We have a diencephalon. We have the brain stem. And the brain stem itself is subdivided into the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla. And then we've got the cerebellum, which is kind of the, the little brain, uh, is what somebody, some people refer to it as. And in the brain, the cerebrum and the cerebellum have an outer gray matter layer called the cortex. So if you're taking a look 
at that outer gray matter. So we're going to look at this, this bottom part right here first of all. Um, that's what we're talking about, this two to four millimeter layer of gray matter. And then down here is the white matter. And then deep within that white matter, there's some basal nuclei that are embedded. If we come more superficially and look at the whole, um, look at the cerebral hemisphere itself, we're just looking at one now. Remember, there's two. There's a right side and a left side to it. So the two cerebral hemispheres form the superior part of the brain, and they are characterized by these ridges and grooves known as gyri and sulci. And if you look at one cerebral hemisphere, you've actually got five lobes that they are separated into. Um, and each of these lobes are separated by one of these um, grooves or a sulci. We have the frontal lobe, we've got the parietal lobe, the temporal lobe, the occipital lobe, and then deep to these is the insular lobe. Okay, And the three basic regions, this gray matter, the white matter, and then deep in the white matter, these basal nuclei, are all embedded throughout all of the lobes that you're seeing here. Okay, so. When we talk about the cerebral cortex, remember we're only talking about that gray matter that's sitting there, okay? So the gray matter is superficial, the white matter is internal, and then deep within the white matter are the basal nuclei. Taking a deeper look at the cerebral cortex, okay, like I said, it's two to four millimeters in thickness. Um, it's very superficial layer, but because of the gyri and sulci, it ends up making up 40% of the mass of, of an adult brain. What's going on in this two to four millimeters of, of space is, is the side of your, your consciousness. Your conscious mind is sitting in that little layer there, that superficial layer. This is where you have your awareness, your sensory perception, your voluntary motor initiation, your communication, your memory storage, uh, general understanding, basic understanding comes from this layer here. And if you look, depending on which lobe you're in, some of those areas are centralized uh, or localized in a specific lobe. So if you look back here, in the cerebral cortex, you've got a lot of the visual uh, components. You go a little deeper over here towards the temporal, and you're looking more at, um, the, there's a multimodal area within this area uh, coming up to the front. We're going to focus more on the frontal area here, this prefrontal cortex. So you've got the frontal lobe here, and you've got this prefrontal cortex. We're going to focus a lot of our attention today on that um, because there's a lot of your, your working memory and, and uh, object recall tasks are going to occur, the problem solving. So let's take a little bit deeper look at the prefrontal cortex. Um, what brain research has indicated is that brain development is not complete until nearly the age of 25. And we always we hear that occasionally saying, oh, you know, he's a teenager, she's a teenager, they're impulsive, their frontal lobe is the size of a raisin, you know, comments like that, that's why they're impulsive. Um, this is what we're talking about, is that, that, that prefrontal lobe in that area. Um, now that doesn't mean that it's not functioning, it just means that it's not as well developed until you're somewhere around 25 years of age. Um, it, it, it's an interesting component because it has a lot to do in terms of what's going on in there. The maturation process, you see a big change in the person as they transition from, say, a five or six year old to that prepubescent, early pubescent stage to the adolescent teenager stages. When you're looking at those, not only are hormones playing a big role in it, but the, the maturation of the prefrontal lobe is going to play a big role in it as well. The big thing is when you go from that 18 to 25 stage, that's when you start to see a big change in personalities and behaviors because by that time you're reaching the maturity of that, of that region. So when we're looking at the, the functionality of the prefrontal cortex, it is referred to sometimes as the CEO of the brain, okay? It, it's responsible for a lot of the cognitive work, cognitive analysis, abstract thought, moderation of, of appropriate or correct social behaviors and social situations comes from this part of the brain. The other thing that's really important is, at, in terms of being the CEO of the brain is that this is where the so-called executive functions reside. So that the executive functions of your, your behaviors and your actions resides in the prefrontal lobe. And when we talk about 
executive functions. We're talking about things like focused attention. We're talking about organizing your thoughts, problem solving, um, considering the future and making predictions, the ability to balance short-term rewards with long-term goals. Um, in terms of more impulsive behaviors and things like that, or, the, or lessening your impulsive behaviors, initiating appropriate behavior comes from here. Modulation of intense emotions comes from here. Um, the impulse control and delaying gratification comes from here. So as you reach that maturity of the prefrontal lobe, these executive functions are more mature and, or, and more honed in. And we're going to look mostly at the prefrontal cortex in terms of some of these executive functions. We're going to look at the focusing attention, the problem solving, the making predictions, the considering the future, the balancing the short-term rewards with long-term goals, because those are very relevant to what's happening in a learning environment, whether you're in a classroom or you're in an online platform. This is what's really relevant to, to the learning process. So let's step away from the anatomy lesson for a moment and, and look at this question here. Why do so many people spend so much time on Facebook? I could change that and put the bird up there and say, why do so many people spend so much time on Twitter? What is, what is it that is attracting everybody to spend so much of their, their effort, their, their waking moments, and sometimes they stay awake because they are focused on their Facebook page or they're busy tweeting out? What is it that's the driving force behind this? Okay, think about, you know, if you're a Facebook fan, if you're a Twitter fan, think about what it is that drives you to spend that extra moment or, or delay dinner a little bit or delay going to bed because you're working on it. Think about your own personal being. And if you're older and you've got teenage kids or something like that, try to think about what puts them into that situation. What is it that drives them? I'm going to give you a second to think about it. Okay, research. Now, granted, Facebook hasn't been around that long, neither has Twitter, but we've been able to collect a lot of data, and research has found that there is a link between a person's drive to build a better reputation and the intensity of their Facebook usage. Same thing goes for Twitter, okay? The activities actually stimulate a reward center within the brain. There's a component within the reward center known as the nucleus accumbens, and it is this component that figures into a wide variety of cravings. And Facebook and Twitter and similar uh, electronic stimulants, shall we say, fit into that craving category. Um, and this is the same craving that people get when they uh, crave food, when they crave sex, when they are getting into a gambling crave, um, alcohol, those kind of things fit into that reward center and are stimulated by that or stimulate the nucleus accumbens and Facebook and Twitter and these kind of interactions do the same thing. So let's look at this reward center, this reward circuit in a little bit more detail. So the areas in our brains whose role is to provide a pleasurable sensation, which is what we refer to as that reward is important because it actually carries out vital functions, okay? Eating, drinking, having sex, displaying maternal behaviors are all activities that are essential for the survival of the individual and survival of the species. In the course of evolution, natural selection has associated strong feelings of satisfaction with these behaviors to meet the basic survival needs. Uh, it, if you take a look, there's a veritable reward circuit that evolved to encourage the behaviors so that subsequently the circuits can expand to encourage us to repeat those survival behaviors. As a result, though, of expanding that reward circuit for survival and basic needs, we have also ended up expanding those to pleasurable experiences that we learn in the course of our lives and we're like, oh, that feels so good, so let's do it again, you know, and it's beyond just the I need food, I need to reproduce the species, I need to be maternal to my offspring. It has become more than just that. So the structures, if we look at the, the structures within, they're very interconnected with one another and they form this, this circuitry 
Um, we've got something known as the ventral tegmental area, or VTA. It's a group of neurons at the very center of the brain. It plays an essentially an important role in the circuit. It receives information from several other regions, um, telling us, you know, how various fundamental needs are going to be satisfied. How, you know, how are we going to get that satisfaction taken care of? Um, the VTA then forwards the information to other structures, um, such as the nucleus accumbens, that, which then sends information to, from the nucleus accumbens, the VTA uses particular messenger to communicate between it and the nucleus accumbens. And that messenger that it communicates with is a neurotransmitter known as dopamine. And dopamine, in, it can increase the, when you increase the level of dopamine in the nucleus accumbens and in other brain regions, it reinforces the behavior which will satisfy those, those needs, okay? So you, you start getting into this kind of a feedback loop when you start getting that, okay, I need this, I'm going to release some dopamine to do the communicating. And as you release more dopamine, it feels good, so you start to do things to reinforce that release of the dopamine. Um, the site where most drugs act, you know, when you're talking about um, meth or coke or you're talking about LSD, you're looking at an area um, that in this reward circuit, that's what's being stimulated by these drug dependencies and what tends to amplify that drug dependency. So the reward circuit, you know, other than the drug dependency, it, it's, it also includes several other structures. The septum's involved, the amygdala's involved, the prefrontal cortex is involved, and then certain parts of the thalamus are also involved. And each of these structures appears to participate in its own way in various aspects of behavioral response. Now, when we're looking at all of this interconnectedness, um, what we do see is that these centers are not only interconnected with one another, but they also innervate the hypothalamus. So if you look at the red arrows here, okay, you're looking at that innervation with the hypothalamus, and that in, is in informing it of, of the presence of the reward, okay? So the lateral and the ventral medial nuclei of the hypothalamus are especially involved in the reward circuit. And then the hypothalamus can act in return not only to the VTA, but also to the autonomic nervous system and to some of the endocrine functions throughout the body. And, they, and it does this through the pituitary gland in terms of releasing certain hormones. Okay, and so then you get this bigger rush because you've got more chemicals in the body that you're having interact with one another just simply by a few stimulations of the dopamine hitting the right parts of this circuit. So let's take a look at, at dopamine. Um, so it's a part of the network that plays a, a, an important role in cognitive function. So it's not only the drug addiction components that we're going to be looking at. You know, we're not going to look at those right now. We're going to look at the impact that it has on cognitive function. And although multiple dopamine receptors have been studied, um, there's uh, one subtype in particular that tends to impact learning and memory, and that's the D1 receptor. It seems to play uh, a more prominent role in mediating the neuroplasticity and mediating specific aspects of cognitive function, including spatial learning and memory processes and reversal learning, extinction learning, incentive learning, or some people know it as, a, as incentive motivation. All of those have, are impacted by uh, release of dopamine. It has been established that dopamine is uh, dopamine in the brain is an important goal-directed chemical in terms of your behavior. So goal-directed behavior is very much so um, impacted by dopamine. Okay, so it's a very important neurotransmitter. When we're looking at the, the major behaviors of do dopamine, okay, we're talking about movement, cognition, pleasure, motivation, but we're going to focus on how it interacts at other levels. So in certain areas of the brain, when dopamine is released, it gives one the feeling, it gives you the, the feeling of pleasure or, or satisfaction. And these feelings of satisfaction become desired. And the person will grow a desire for that satisfaction. So to satisfy that desire, the person will repeat the behaviors that causes the release of dopamine. So let's, let's take, you know, for an example, if you look at food and sex, they release dopamine. That's why a person wants food, even though their, might, their body might not be craving, might not need the food, but you crave the food. 
Okay, or the same thing with sex. There's a, just that certain thing of, you know, I don't need to reproduce the species right now, but there's a craving for that sex, and it's driven by, by the dopamine. So the two behaviors scientifically make sense because the body needs food to survive, and humans need to have sex to allow the species to survive. However, other less natural behaviors have the same effects on, on your dopamine levels, and at times you can even be, it can be even more powerful. And often the behaviors can result in addiction due to the effects of the dopamine, and the addiction can then have negative effects on, on your well-being. So, um, you know, and the, these would be the, the examples of, you know, the chemical addictions, whether it be alcohol or other drugs or gambling, things like that. Or, you know, if you become addicted to Facebook, you, you could always blame your dopamine levels. So extra dopamine is released when there's an enjoyable experience. So dopamine helps control the brain's reward and pleasure centers. It also helps regulate movement and emotional responses, and it enables us to not only see rewards, but to take action to move towards them. Okay, so if, if you're talking about an addiction, that's, that's kind of the way the addiction works, is you get that feeling, and the dopamine actually helps you not only feel good about that, stimulus, but it also pushes you to drive for more. You take action to move towards more pleasure and getting more dopamine released. And it's an additive effect because the dopamine stimulates a handful of neurons and then those neurons reach out with their dopamine and stimulate more neighboring neurons and you get this kind of amplification process going. So consequently, the boost in dopamine not only increases your sense of pleasure, but it also increases other neurotransmitters. So not only is dopamine getting released, but now you get things like acetylcholine um, that is responsible for uh, enhanced alertness and memory, and you get some more of the executive functions getting involved because of the acetylcholine. Um, and remember, those, those executive functions are important in terms of learning, motivation, and engagement, because this is where you get your focusing of attention, this is where you get your problem solving, this is where you get your forming strategies and planning. So the dopamine is not the only culprit, but it is the, the precursor. It's the one that starts the whole chain reaction off. Now besides acetylcholine, another important neurotransmitter that dopamine interacts with and, and helps to stimulate is serotonin. Okay, And ser serotonin can affect mood, appetite, sleep, as well as cognition, learning and memory in particular. So Looking at, at dopamine, biochemically it's derived from the amino acid tryptophan, okay? And amino acids are something that you get from consuming protein. And serotonin, serotonin is primarily found in the GI tract. It's also found in the platelets of your bloodstream. But in the ner and there is some serotonin in your central nervous system, okay? It is popularly thought to be a contributor to that feeling of well-being and happiness. And, and what it does in the GI tract is that when serotonin is released in the GI tract, you start to get that, that, that feeling of satiety. You know, oh, I ate the big turkey dinner at Thanksgiving, and I had the big piece of pumpkin pie, and now I'm ready to sit in my Lazy Boy and kind of relax and just watch some football and veg out, maybe even take a little nap. That's the serotonin effect. So you get a pleasure, but it's a calming pleasure rather than a, ooh, I want more pleasure that you get from dopamine, okay? Um, so about 90% of the human body's total serotonin is lo located in some cells in the, in the gut where it is used to regulate intestinal movement. You want to calm down after a big meal and put all your efforts not in brain function and not in muscle activity, but in the GI tract actually breaking down your food, digesting it, and starting to take it into the cells and process it. And if you're busy exercising after a meal and jumping around and playing around, your GI tract can't do the digestive process as well because your efforts are not being focused solely on the GI tract. It's being focused on your muscles because you're busy jumping and walking and, and thinking and things like that. Um, so that's what serotonin, evolutionarily, serotonin's function is to get you to settle down so you can focus, your body can focus on the digestive process. But let's look at the remainder of the of the serotonin. Okay, the, so we got 90% of the gut. Let's look at the other 10%. The remainder is synthesized from specific neurons in the central nervous system, where it has a variety of functions, um, including the regulation of mood, appetite, and sleep. Okay, but it also, as I mentioned before, it also has some cognitive function uh, impact on cognitive function in the learning and memory areas. 
if you take a look at your students, whether you're in the classroom face to face or if you're in an online situation, and if you just think about the way they behave and their just day to day lifestyles and stuff, one of the things to keep in mind is their diet. Their diet can actually impact their learning and um, memory processing. Okay, an increase in the ratio of the amino acid tryptophan. Okay, as long as you can get that tryptophan to convert, to, you get the tryptophan and phenylalanine and other amino acids that's of importance in this, as well as leucine. An increase in the ratio of these three amino acids will increase serotonin levels. So fruits with a good ratio um, are something good to have. So if you're going to need a lot of learning and memory going on, one of the things you can do is prepare for it by eating properly. You know, things like dates and papayas and bananas, we don't think about those as brain foods and stuff, but they are. They're really good brain food because of the, the ratios that you're looking at in terms of the tryptophan, the phenylalanine, um, and the leucine, and being able to do that. And, and so, you know, there's research out there that suggests eating a diet rich in carbohydrates and low in protein will increase your serotonin by secreting insulin, okay, which helps in your amino acid competition. Now, don't go to the extreme because the other end of that is by increasing your insulin for a long period of time, it can actually trigger the onset of this insulin resistance and obesity, type 2 diabetes, and as a result of all of that, you can actually lower your serotonin levels. So there's a fine balance between making sure you get enough of the amino acids and get your serotonin levels produced properly, but you can also overshoot it and get so much that you end up causing your own serotonin levels to drop because you're, you're getting it out of balance. That's a typical addiction situation that you go to one extreme or the other, not get that balance. So serotonin, it's not the neurotransmitter itself as much as it is what receptors, like dopamine, what receptors it interacts with. So recent studies have led to the discovery of various types and subtypes of receptors that help to differentiate, um, or they, they differentially associate with various cognitive mechanisms in terms of how the serotonin interacts with them. So serotonin localized in what, what is called cognitive pathways within the hippocampus and the frontal cortex, um, those are the main target structures and those are where we're also seeing the learning and memory processing. So there are some serotonin receptor types that are there that when those receptors are interacting with the serotonin, you're going to get that, that memory and learning processing stimulated. So as serotonin is released in response to a stimulus, it attaches to the receptors of the next cell down the line, raising its excitability level and increasing the chance that it'll become a part of a circuit that encodes memory. Okay, let me repeat that. It, it becomes a part of the circuit that encodes memory. So this is part of that area where you're wanting to go, okay, I need to get these students to convert from this rote memory, which is short term, to encoding it into more of a long-term memory process so that three, four, five, 10, 12, 14 weeks down the road, they still have that, they've retained that knowledge. So it's important in terms of knowledge retention because you're encoding it into a long-term memory rather than keeping it just in the, just stimulating a short-term memory. So serotonin also enhances the neurons' electrical impulses, creating that enduring memory. The, the response, the, these responses, um, turn on at different stages of development and underlie two distinctive types of learning, one known as sensitization and the other one known as dishabituation, which also is referred to as desensitization. So, you know, you can go back and look at Pavlov's dogs and some of those situations and that's what we're talking about in terms of decreasing or increasing response based on your stimulus. Um, if you're thinking in terms of sensitization, let me think of an example. Um, something happens and you, it keeps happening to you more and more and more, and every time it happens to you, you get a little more bothered each time until finally you kind of erupt. You know, you, you either do something about it or, you know, there's just somebody that's really getting on your nerves because they keep doing the same thing over and over again, and it just makes you explode. That's sensitization, whereas habituation or desensitization is just the opposite. If that same thing happens to you more and more and more, instead of getting bothered by it and irate and, and blowing up, it bothers you less and less. You become desensitized to the stimulus, okay? And so serotonin is involved in those two type of, of behavioral processes. So just putting the, the dopamine and the serotonin together, okay, there's this mesolimbic pathway, which you're, you're looking at 
um, that involves this, you know, look at the dopamine, you look at the serotonin, the pathways, you're looking at a lot of the same structures that are going to be involved, the VTA, the midbrain, the limbic system, the nucleus accumbens, the amygdala, the hippocampus, as well as the medial prefrontal cortex, all kind of interacting in some way, shape, or form, either the same exact locations or some differentiation there, but there are some overlays between where dopamine and serotonin pathways are going to interact and cross over one another. Where you're talking about, you know, the dopamine in terms of the reward, motivation, you're talking about pleasure, euphoria, uh, motor function, compulsion, perseverance, whereas the serotonin pathways, you've got more of the, the subtle mood, you've got the memory processing, you've got the sleep, you've got the cognition. But there is some balance that has to occur between the two um, the two, do, uh, the two neurotransmitters. So the, this mesolimbic dopamine system that we're looking like is widely believed to be a reward pathway. Now there might be more reward pathways. This is just the one that's best studied. But um, there is still some question in terms of this, is this the be all end all or is there, are there other reward pathways we need to understand with other neurotransmitters as well. Like I said, this is the one that's most studied, but there, there's still some question out there as to, you know, there's got to be more to it. It's got to be more complex than what we've narrowed it down to. Um, but one of the things that we do know that we can look at in terms of these two neurotransmitters, and I've kind of alluded to this before, serotonin is kind of the Zen master among the neurotransmitters. It's linked to the tranquility. It's linked to the reason, the calmness, whereas dopamine is more of the, the Pollyanna among neurotransmitters, it it only really responds to the good stuff. Okay, in our in our dopamine system, when it's active, um, we're more positive, we're more excited, we're more eager to go after goals and rewards, whether it's food, sex, money, education, professional achievement, um, and it, it suggests that people who are goal directed, you know, the Steve Jobs of the world, the um, you know, the CEO of Yahoo and, and Hewlett Packard and things like that, those type of goal-directed people um, seem to not only be motivated, but because of the, not only the dopamine, the Pollyanna of the world, but because of the Zen master, they tend to be very, they generally tend to be happier people. And um, there has been some studies, you know, just interviews with some of these big CEO types, these very motivated uh, overachiever types, and the, the study has revealed that a lot of them actually do spend some time meditating and there's got to be that balance there. So they are really um, nurturing their Zen master, their serotonin, as well as being driven by their dopamine and they have a good balance because if they didn't, they wouldn't get where they're going. So they've, they've found that balance between their Zen master and their Pollyanna. Okay, so what does all of this neuroscience babble have to do with me? What does it have to do with learning and, and what I have to do in the classroom? Let's take a look at putting this together. Have you ever been in a preoccupied state of mind, preoccupied with thoughts um, when you're attending a session, whether it's this one currently, <laughs> or you're sitting in another workshop in face-to-face -face situation, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about, oh, let's see, when are we going to get a break? Oh, I've got to stop at the grocery store and I've got to pick up this, oh, i got to put gas in my car before, you know think about it. I mean, we've all been in that situation. We've all been in that professor's classroom where we're just like, oh, when is he going to get to the end of this? Um, sometimes it's not the professor's fault at all. You know, we're, he might be a very exciting, very enthusiastic person and, and there's just, we're preoccupied. Okay. So think about a, a, a seminar, a presentation, a training, a class that you've attended recently. What are some of the specific things that the presenter did that got or held your attention. Just think about it a moment. Sit, put yourself back in that spot and go, what did they do that not only grabbed my attention but helped me to sustain that attention? Okay. Put that, put that on the side of your brain for a second. Now conversely, what were some of the things that either that presenter or another presenter did that were irritating, boring, or both? Okay, if you were to go out and do a survey and ask people, when, when, when asked a lot of these types of questions, a lot of people almost always produce a good list of characteristics of motivating versus demotivating instructors. Yet, uh, despite this personal knowledge resulting from years of classes or seminars or whatever, 
and, and saying, yes, I know that this, this person excited me. This is what motivated me about this person. This is why I was really interested. People usually feel they don't have a good or an adequate grasp of motivation, especially when they have to design or teach a course themselves. They can sit in a, in a presentation and say, wow, that was such an exciting presentation. I got so much out of it. It was so stimulating. And they can write things down, but then when you ask them to put that in action, they start to question their, their own selves um, and start to think, well, do I really, I don't have a grasp of what's going to motivate my students. Well, yet they really do. Um, it, it, there's just a disconnect. So back to our boring student situation, what do we do about it? Okay, so when a student feels bored, research shows that there are, they, they actually are aware of their own difficulty paying attention. Okay, we're doing more and more research on this and finding out that it's not that they're bored that they don't realize that they're bored. They actually do have some realization and some consciousness about the fact that they are having a hard time paying attention. And a student may attribute the experience to not being interested in the material or in the lecture style because of some learning modality. But new studies show that stressors, that any stress or distraction that takes up working memory from the emotional trauma to attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, all could contribute to this feeling of boredom or this lack of focus, okay? So it's not just that you're, you know, you might be the most animated, most theatrical lecturer there is, and you'll still find that one or two student in this 200 or 300 room lecture hall, you might find one or two students that are still quote unquote bored or not focused, and it has nothing to do with you as the lecturer, it has nothing to do with the material or the content, it actually has to do with other stressors um, or distractions that are taking up that that working memory. So they can't focus. And remember that working memory and that focusing of attention lies within the prefrontal lobe because that's one of your executive functions. So that area is being taken up by something else. You can't fit in all the exciting lectures about um, Plato or, you know, when you're discussing the Iliad and the Odyssey, yeah, yeah right, I'm a biologist, uh, you know, when you're talking about really cool things like the new snake species that they just found out in the Amazon or something like that, when you get excited about it, you could be all excited and you still lose that one or two students because their working memory is being occupied by something else. So focusing attention, part of those executive functions in the prefrontal cortex, if, if that working memory is being occupied by something else, then it's really hard to get over that, no matter how much you're dancing on the stage or how much you are being enthusiastic, there's still going to be that barrier that needs to be overcome. So let's see if we can overcome that barrier some way. Let's take a look at games. And you're going to go, oh, this is all about gamification. This has nothing, well, it doesn't have nothing to do with gamification, but let's look at the gamer's model, okay? Whether it be the Rubik's Cube or the old-fashioned pinball wizards, you know, pinball kind of stuff, Pac-Man, I'm showing my age by this slide, right? Um, I had to put the Angry Birds space up there because that's the newer version, the newer century kind of stuff, but I'm, I'm the Pac-Man, Tetris, pinball, Rubik's Cube generation. Um, it's all the same, though. Whether you're doing World of Warcraft, you're doing Angry Birds, whatever is out there that's, that's stimulating you and exciting you, even if, it, even if you stop and think about Facebook and Twitter, it's still the same thing. So games insert players at their achievable challenge level, and they reward the player's efforts. And they're, not only their efforts are rewarded, but the practice with some kind of acknowledgement of incremental goal progress. It's not just the final product. It's not just winning the game, okay? It is getting to go from stage one to stage two or level one to level two, and each time you move from one of those levels, you get, okay, I've achieved this. I can take a deep breath. I'm going to go on to the next one because I'm that into it. I really want to. I've seen that I put this much effort into it. I can achieve this goal. Woohoo! I'm excited. Let's go on to the next one. I put in a little bit different effort. It doesn't have to be more effort. It can be, you know, it's different. I'm mean, thinking about Mario. Sometimes it wasn't that it was a harder level. It was just a different 
in terms of the hurdles and the challenges within the Mario that you had to deal with from one level to the next. So it's, it's that, you know, you're rewarded for your efforts, you're rewarded for the practice by having these acknowledgments of the incremental goals, okay? Incremental, not that final big, okay, bam, I got an A on my final exam, okay? The fuel that compels computer game perseverance and can also motivate academic or other skill learning is the reward circuit, specifically dopamine. Okay, so looking at this game model, during the play of a computer game with progressive levels of challenge, the progressive achievement feedback, such as getting to the higher level of play, is the feedback to the brain that has succeeded in the challenge and made the correct response. So these bursts of pleasure drive the brain to seek the next burst so that the gamer upon reaching the next level wants to continue on playing even though increasing challenge and frequent failure occurs okay so you're you're getting this this feedback you know when you look at this right here as you get this burst of pleasure you your brain seeks a little more of a burst you go up to the next challenge get some feedback the the feedback of the brain you get that burst of pleasure from the dopamine, then your brain says, oh, I want more, I like it, you know, it feels good, so let's keep it going. Okay. Actually, if the level of play does not pose new challenge, it doesn't have to be more complicated, it just has to be a new challenge, the gamer loses interest as the dopamine reward response will not take place if there is no new task or no new skill to master, okay? So it's not necessarily that it's more complicated or it's a higher quote-unquote level, it just needs to be a new challenge, okay? If you don't get that, game over. You don't, you're not getting that pleasure feedback loop going, so you just, you know, you don't get the response stimulated, you start to lose interest and you shut down the game and you go elsewhere, okay? And that's something that we've got to keep in mind when we're in, in the classroom, whether it be an online classroom or, or in a face-to-face -face classroom. We don't want this. We want the previous slide. Okay. Norma, you're not making a whole lot of sense here. You're, you're throwing some things out there. You kind of got my attention, but how does this connect to learning? Okay, where is that bridge that you keep telling me is occurring between all of this neuroscience and what I'm going to actually do in the classroom. So what we've got to do is the, the same brain processes and neurochemicals that compel people to skip meals, to skip sleeping because they would rather play a video game needs to be activated by the, the, the teacher, by the faculty member, by the instructor to increase the brain's motivation to be attentive, an attentive class participant, to do homework with focus, and even reverse that negative feeling about school and ignite that joy for learning. We've got to tap into that same pleasure loop as the games do to make sure that it's like, oh, God, I had such a rotten day at school. I had to sit through all these boring classes. I just, oh, and I've got all this homework. I just don't want to do it. I'd rather go, you know, sit in front of my video game, whether you're, you know, into PS2 or whatever. See, that's how bad I'm out of it. But you would rather do those things rather than study. What is it that we are doing wrong that we're not getting those bursts of dopamine in our students' brains? Now, these students look pretty happy. These look very engaged. Both of them look rather motivated. Okay, what is it that is being done right in these situations, okay, that's not being done right in those situations where the student walks out of the classroom going, oh, I didn't get anything out of it. I would have had more fun hanging out at the student union. Okay, so what do we do with this? What, what do we do with this information? Okay, Norma, you're telling me that we're missing out on that, you know, if I'm a gamer, I want to skip sleep, I want to skip meals. I love that dopamine release, but for some reason we're not doing it in the classroom and you're telling me to reverse that and figure out how to do it. What am I going to do? 
How, how do we take care of this? Okay, step, no, I don't know, I don't want to give it to you as a step one, step two. Things to keep in mind, okay? Meaningful learning occurs, okay? Meaningful meaning that you're going to start tapping into those executive functions. You're going to start tapping into that reward circuit by making sure that what's happening in the classroom, whether it be online or face-to-face, -face, that mean meaningful learning is occurring. And that happens when we transition from the teacher-centered environment to one that is learner-centered. And if you think about what education is all about, is it about the teacher? No. It's about the learner. It's not about the student. When we talk about teacher-student relationships, or teacher versus student, we're not talking about what's going on or what is supposed to be going on. What is supposed to be going on in that classroom is learning. And that does not happen when you're the sage on the stage. It does not happen when it's all about the teacher and the teacher's experiences in the Galapagos Islands or the teacher's experience in Madagascar or the teacher's experience. You know, yeah, that adds to the enthusiasm, that adds to the passion. But it isn't about the teacher. You've been there. You've done it. You've got your degree. You've succeeded. It's all about the student, and we've got to make it about that learning process. So we need to make it learning-centered to make the learning meaningful. For students to remain motivated, okay, and this means that we've got to make sure that we're stimulating that dopamine reward response. If we want them attentive and we want to stimulate that burst of pleasure, Students must participate. You cannot have meaningful learning. You cannot be an engaged student. You cannot be a motivated student if the student does not participate. And that is where the burden comes on to the person that is doing the teaching. Because no longer is it about you. It's about making sure that student is participating. Because that's when they're going to learn. That's when they're going to be engaged. That's when they're going to be motivated. That's where they're going to get the dopamine release. And they're going to continue to be motivated and engaged. They've got to participate. Taking from the gaming model, achievable challenge with incremental progress is motivating. And that's the way you're going to keep, especially those students that don't like to participate, those that like to just be the mouse in the corner, the fly on the wall, those students aren't learning. And the reason why they're the fly, the fly on the wall or they're the wallflower or whatever you want to call them is because they haven't been engaged. They haven't been motivated. They haven't felt that, oh, man, that feels so good dopamine. Okay, so as a really good teacher, what you've got to do is get that fly on the wall motivated. How do you do that? You make sure you get them that incremental progress because it's those little challenges. Every time they got that new little challenge, you don't want game over. You want, I want to go to the next level. I need to go to the next level. Look, I've succeeded. I put this much effort in, and I've got something out of it, okay? The other thing that research is, is uh, indicating these days, and we, we didn't know, we thought this, but we didn't really have a good grasp on it 20, 30 years ago. More recently, uh, within the past 10, 12 years, personal relevance has been a, a more of an attention getter in, in the world of, of learning science type materials. Personal relevance boosts student engagement and motivation. And what happens is you've got to bring the, the content, not flat one-dimensional content. You've got to bring the the, the content into that personal realm. Personalize what's going on. Okay? Don't use the same boring, dry lectures semester after semester. And if you're going to, at least update them. Tweak them a little bit by bringing in some hear me now type of scenarios. Hear me now means something that's relevant here, locally, close to me, physically. What, what is it about me? It doesn't have to be a, a, a local me, but something that's relevant to me as a human being, me as a person, me as a student, or something relevant to now. If you're talking about the Civil War, if you're talking about the, the War of 1812, make it relevant to now as well. If you can bring that historical aspect to the present day, that's going to be more personal relevance to the student, and it's going to boost their engagement. It's going to boost their motivation. Connect to current events. Okay, relate to students' interests. In an online class, a lot of times you have your 
introduction post at the very beginning. And this is a time for you to really go in there and inventory what are some of the students' interests. Oh, I know that this student, you know, grew up on a dairy farm. So when I get to, you know, certain chapters, maybe I can start bringing this in. If you're in microbiology, you know, okay, you can start bringing in some really cool diseases with cows and humans. You can start talking about prions and things like that and bring it back to to their to their relevance, to their personal relevance by bringing in something that they're interested in. If you've got students that are skateboarders and you're teaching an anatomy and physiology class start to, and you're talking about the knee joint or you're talking about elbow injuries or something like that, you can start bringing in some of that relevance to those students who are the skateboarders in the classroom, okay? The skiers, the soccer players. Oh, well, why did you blow out your ACL? You know, those that are really into skiing, oh, gee, you know, did you hear Lindsey Vaughn just blah, 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 partial torn ACL, da, 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 bring that in when you're starting to talk about, you know, the knee joint and some of the, the, the pathology that can occur with the knee joint, okay? The personal relevance really does grab the student's attention because it makes it relevant to them. And, and we are selfish creatures in some ways. And so if you can make it relevant to you, that selfishness helps a little bit as well. Keep in mind, let me think about on the personal relevance one, the other thing that we, we tend to make a mistake on and we, we're finding out, in, and I mean we in terms of the bigger umbrella of academia, that one of the things that we have lost out on, even though we know personal relevance is important and engaging and motivation, we are doing less and less of it in the K-12 classroom, and we are starting to do less and less of it in the post-secondary classroom as well. You want to know why? Because we're teaching to the test too much. And this is a little bit of my high horse, a little bit of my soapbox. But teaching to the test results in low personalization. And that gives little opportunity to recognize that incremental progress towards personally meaningful goals, which comes back to those executive functions in the prefrontal cortex. So the idea is we need to get away from that teaching to the test because that's where one of the areas that we're losing the students in terms of engagement and motivation. Okay, encouragement. It helps the students and it helps to acknowledge that incremental progress. And, and teaching the test, you just don't get that. You just really miss out on that. So that's just something to keep in mind. Long-term memory increases due to memorable engagement. What does this mean? Once again, it is that if you can transition and get the serotonin to get involved a little bit more, then you're not putting things in short-term memory, you're getting things to get put into long-term memory, and that is gonna occur if you have memorable engagement. If they can link that piece of knowledge to some other memory or something else relevant into their memory, then it gets stored in long-term memory rather than short-term memory. It comes back to the personal relevance or it comes back to the hear me now. It comes back to the current event. Something that is already in their brain in a memory storage component, if you can link it to that, you don't have to personally go in there and say, well, let me have an experience that I can show you to link it to. You've just got to bring it out there so where they can go, oh, you mean like, okay? One of the things that is really interesting in, in anatomy and physiology is when you start talking about the rhinocephalon, okay, part of the brain that has a lot to do with smell, okay, and you go, well, do you ever have that occasion where you get on an elevator with somebody and you smell something and all of a sudden you flash back to seventh grade Valentine's Day dance? You know, and you're 40 some odd years old and you have that flashback because somebody was wearing polo cologne in the elevator. You know, and you start to talk about that. You start talking about the limbic system. You talk about, you know, and all these cool things. You make that link going, oh, wow, I had this flashback. If the students can make those connections, then that new knowledge that you're giving to them, that you're presenting to them, you're giving them the opportunity to learn, that knowledge retention is going to be much longer and greater if they've got memorable engagement because then it's going to get stored in long-term memory instead of short-term memory. The other thing is that when students perform tasks, their brain is going to retain the information about the task much more, much longer and in much more detail, okay? So this is, and I know there's going to be students that are going, oh, but I'm not a tactile learner. I'm not a kinesthetic learner. Yes, they are. They just don't realize that it doesn't mean that you have to be the best model builder on earth. It doesn't mean that you have to be the best. But when they're actually performing the task, whether it's drawing it or performing the piece of music or whatever it is, as long as they're performing something, 
not just sitting there like a mushroom listening to some lecture capture. If they're active in that by performing a task relevant to that, they are not only going to learn it better and deeper, okay, they're going to learn more details about it and they're going to retain it longer, okay? Immersion in complex experience naturally leads to some processing, but the processing is improved through appropriate facilitation. What does that mean? If you have immersion in a complex experience, it's naturally going to lead to some processing, but the processing is improved through appropriate facilitation. Now, let's, are we going to dissect the sentence? No. Okay. So giving learners the opportunity to work in a laboratory setting, for example, Okay, or attend a field trip. Okay, we're all told, yeah, that's well and good, that's all exciting. That's not enough. Okay, that, yes, we just said performing a task is going to help them deeper, longer, so on and so forth. You've got to immerse them, okay, because just going through the task without a conscious effort, just manipulating something without the thought going into it and without the total immersion in it, they're not going to get as much out of it. I mean, that's why a lot of the linguistics uh, will tell you if you want to learn a language, don't just sit there and listen to your headphones and try to memorize the alphabet in, in Spanish or learn a few Japanese phrases that are going to get you through the market. The best thing to do is go live there. Go to Mexico and live in Mexico for six weeks. Don't take your English-Spanish dictionary with you either. <laughs> the immersion is what's going to help you. So immersion in those complex activities. So if you're in a laboratory setting, or if you're in a field trip, being there, I mean, you can be at the field museum all you want, staring at the cool mastodon, but it's not going to mean much to you unless you're immersed in it, unless there's really good facilitation. And this is where the teacher has to get involved to make it a more active process. So they must actively process, the students must actively process that experience and connect it to the larger learning objectives. And this is where a good faculty member, a good teacher comes into play. The teacher's role as facilitator of learning is to engage the student in the conscious as well as the unconscious processing. And the student should be given the opportunity to reflect on that experience, draw connections to key concepts, and share their conclusion with others. If you don't have that, if you don't have the preparation before that lab experience or the preparation before the field trip, if they're not totally immersed in the field trip once they get there or totally immersed in the lab once they're there, and if you don't have appropriate follow-up where they get to reflect, where they get to share with others, where they get to draw on those connections, then it's not going to be uh, an optimal learning process for them. So the teacher should also prompt the discussion with pointed questions, encouraging the, the interaction, encouraging that deeper learning to occur. It doesn't mean that you give them the answers. And pointed question doesn't mean that it's a closed-ended question, it's a yes or no, yeah, I guess. You've got to make them pointed questions, but make them open enough that they cannot just simply answer with a yes or no or a maybe. It's got to stimulate deeper thought, it's got to stimulate discussion, and it's got to stimulate something more than a one-word answer. This is the engagement and re-engagement in an online environment in terms of getting those students to really elaborate on things, okay? But you've got to have prompt discussion. If you, if you do something and you don't discuss it until two weeks later, let's say it's the field trip, let's say it's the lab experience, if you do it on Friday but you're discussing it, you know, two weeks down the road, you're not going to get as much out of it as a student, okay? Yeah, oh yeah, I've got to do it because I've got to put a grade in the grade book, so I've got to do it two weeks from now because that's when it's convenient. That's not what's going to learn. That's not where the learning process is going to occur. It's got to be prompt. Oops, where am I going? It's not forwarding. There we go. So discussions among the learners will also alert, allow this peer interaction. Peer learning is also beneficial. Yeah, it can create some problems because occasionally that's where the misconceptions come into play and you get some mythology integrated where you don't want it, okay? But learning from one another helps them to recognize uniqueness of their experience, okay? It also helps them realize that maybe they're not the only one that didn't understand that part of the lab or that part of the field experience or that part of the activity that they did in class, 
Okay, it gives them that chance to say, hey, you know, I'm not the only one that didn't get it. Okay, so some uniqueness is involved, but there's also that commonality that helps them with it. Um, think about what happens when you are interacting with one another as, as a student. Put your, stu your student shoes back on. And when you were in group study sessions or whatever, and it was like, no, this is how the quadratic equation works. This is what I've learned. Here's a shortcut that I've learned from it. When you're having to teach someone else that topic or that subject or that just that little process, you're going to know it better come test time than the other person who didn't do the teaching. Okay, so when you're having to teach others, and this is where the learning from others comes, because as you're learning from one another, it once again gets into the deeper processes of the brain. It gets into that deeper long-term memory. You, once again, you've brought that serotonin level in to get the long-term memory effect. Okay, so with this in mind, it in turn will encourage the brain to place that higher priority on the experience. You know, and you're getting beyond just the rote or recall memory and getting into actual learning that's meaningful and that's deeper. So how do we put it into action? I'm doing pretty bad, aren't I, on time here? <laughs> okay, I will speed up a little bit. Instructional recommendations here. Here's some, so these are just, you know, when you're in a, either a face-to-face -face classroom or an online classroom, these are some of the things that help to bring this theory into practice. Make learning contextual, okay, um, and related to the student's interest. The big picture should not be separated from the details. Okay, studies show that especially with adults, there is a need to understand the big picture to recognize the value of each piece of information encountered. Okay, structure learning around real problems and in teams. That comes back to that personal relevance. Okay, immerse learners in rich, complex, interactive experiences. Okay, we've touched on this. These are things that you can do in terms of whether it's a project or a field trip or a lab experience. Make it make it to where they're it's complex. Make it rich, not not complicated, complex. There's a difference there. Okay, make it interactive. Immerse them in it, and they're going to get a better learning experience out of it. Offer personally meaningful challenges to enhance learning. The student's mind is stimulated to the desired state of alertness. Okay, so that's why you've got to get that personally meaningful challenge in it. Okay, and last but not least, humor aids in learning. It doesn't hurt. Now, in online environments, it's a little challenging because sometimes with electronic communication, things can be misconstrued. But if you can add a little twist, whether it be a little cartoon or something like that, that humor is going to help make those deeper connections. Um, develop some educational tools um, that really do create that brain-friendly environment. Okay. Offer now in a face-to-face -face classroom, this is a little easier to offer these two minutes of time for the student to process the information for every ten minutes of information that you share with them. Translating that to an online environment is a little more challenging, but it just means that you've got to chunk things down, make things in smaller snack sizes. Okay. Use patterns. Patterns and, and acronyms and rhymes and things like that will always help, especially if they're having to do with rote memory kind of things, if they're having to memorize the presidents of the United States from George Washington through there, if there's some kind of a rhythm or a pattern or a rhyme that can go with it, that's always going to be very helpful. And that's helpful whether you're six years old or you're 26 years old. Okay. Periodically suggest the value of good nutrition, good rest, sleep, healthful things, because once again, it's, it's a balance between learning and everything else. And the more endorphins you get, the more of those good feeling chemicals that you get stimulated in your body through good nutrition, rest, sleep, exercise, the better chance you have of being more attentive in class. So how can we specify, what can we do specifically in an online environment since most of us here, that's what we're here for, okay? You've got to move the content from short-term memory to long-term memory through uh, a technique known as elaborate rehearsal. Okay, there's several different things that you can do for this. Role playing is one of them. You can do all sorts of little small group discussions and, and put them over in fish bowls and, and hot seats and things like that in discussions. Get them to role play. Get them to do some debates um, from a more pair experience as well. Art, it, it's amazing how just on a flat HTML page of nothing but text, even if you're just giving instructions on, you know, go to here, go look at this, analyze this, give a two page um, essay on blah, blah, blah. Even a little piece of artwork on that HTML page of nothing but black and white text 
one little piece of graphic or artwork makes a big difference. Okay, music. You know, like before this webinar started, I was teasing Sean in the chat room. I said, "Oh, we need some good elevator music here, or he could perform for us. He could sing for us." Music can make a big difference when you have that dead time and you're just reading something or you're just looking at something. If you got some, you know, even if you're going through a, a PowerPoint where there's no narration on it and you're just having them look through a, a dead PowerPoint, at least put some music to it because then they can create some patterns and some thought with it. Okay, chunking or snacking of content. This is important because this is the incremental of incremental progress. If you put it at those levels of, of possible challenge to where you know that they can achieve something for what effort they're putting in there, and they're going to get some kind of a woohoo at the end, and it's not the final thing, but it's the, I, okay, I've made some progress, I know I'm doing well, okay, I know I understand it, oh wait, I don't understand it, I can take two steps back without getting lost. Those chunks or snacks of content in an online environment are crucial in terms of in that game model because it does give you that incremental progress, okay? Deliver the content through several learning modalities. Okay, you're not going to just have auditory learners on there, you're not going to have just visual learners on there, you're not going to have just kinesthetic, and even the kinesthetic learner is going to benefit from auditory or visual modalities that are presented to them. The same thing goes for if you're an auditory, you're still, if you're immersed in some kind of a performing of a task, you're still going to get something out of it even if you're more of an auditory learner, okay? So give them opportunities to use the different modes of learning or learning styles rather than just one. And we all, you know, as, as educators, we tend to teach the way we learn. You know, if I learn better from having a lot of video clips, then I'll tend to have a lot more video clips in my class. If I tend to be more of a reader, I will have less video clips and less art, and I'll have just a lot of words on there. And that's not necessarily what your audience, your students are going to be. Your students are going to have uh, a diversity of modalities that they learn by, but even those that have a preference, using more than one modality is going to be to their advantage. Um, increase attentiveness, you can do this by using some kind of an engagement piece or what we call a hook. Um, even if it's just a, a, a directed question, if it's just an open-ended question, if it's just a little, oh, by the way, have you heard about, you know, the, the new rocket that went off, da 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 how would this affect, you know, the economy, blah, blah, blah. Just some kind of little driving question, some little tidbit YouTube video, some little music piece just to grab their attention. It doesn't have to be very explicit on the topic, but you can draw it in and it just kind of gets their curiosity going. It wakes them up. It kind of gets them stimulated. It gets their attention to really say, hey, I want to open the door further, meaning I want to go further down this HTML page and, and, and see what else is there, okay? And make sure that you incorporate originality. Uh, you know, the publishers are doing really great out there. They've got some really good money to put all this interactivity, these animations and things like that. But sometimes putting your own personality in there, exuding your own enthusiasm in there is important to the students. So you need to incorporate some of your own originality in there to make sure that the students realize that this isn't just a can off the shelf that you bought at some super store, okay? Um, infuse frequent interaction. Don't let them go two, three, four weeks before you have some kind of interaction with them or where they don't have any interaction with each other for three or four weeks. If you're talking about a 15-week course, you should have interaction with them on a fairly regular basis, whether it's as a class as a whole, interactions with groups within the class, or with individuals in the class. That should be occurring at least on a weekly, if not within a couple of times during the week, okay? Interaction is critical, okay? For the dopamine pleasure feedback, you've got to, to provide almost immediate, just at least prompt and, and frequent um, feedback. They need that to know that that incremental progress is occurring and it's like, yes, I want to go to the next level. I'm not going to do the game over. You've got to give them those little bursts of dopamine. It doesn't take a lot, okay? It needs to be fairly prompt. You know, and in an online environment, we usually say 24 to 48 hours is enough because usually they're, they're posting somewhere at the weird hours of the night or whatever. But the, you can give little ones and more frequently and that's going to do a lot for them than giving them this big, huge feedback dump once a week. That's not going to do it for them, okay? That's not going to keep them wanting to play the game. So to kind of wind things down, motivated, active learning. How do we do it? Evidence of that motivated, active, attentive, engaged learning, what is it? Well, when your learner is motivated, when they are active, when they are attentive, when they're engaged, okay? 
you will notice that they are making more observations. You will notice that um, they are noticing things with focused attention because they will be interacting with you. They will be demanding more interaction with you because they'll make better observations, deeper observations, and they'll want to communicate that. They will be doing more discovering, more thinking, more inquiry. Um, and when they start making those discoveries, they will also, once again, reach out to their peers, reach out to you going, hey, you know what? There was this listeria outbreak, blah, 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 and they make that connection and they share it with, with you, with the class and everything else. They make those discoveries. They're thinking deeper. They're, they're taking that and making it personally relevant, um, which means that they're putting it more into that long-term memory. Engaged, motivated learners, okay, what this is going to do is if they are engaged, if they are motivated, if they're interested, because you've done a really good job of designing your course and designing the content in such a way that it is learner-centered and not teacher-centered, they'll be engaged, they'll be motivated, they'll be interested, and they will become self-propelled learners. And they will want to come back. And they will not have that negative and bad taste in their mouth about what school is all about. Engaged, motivated, interest, self-propelled, and that's what you as an instructor, you as a teacher want to do, and you can do it with taking some of these steps.